Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we are at least going to begin tackling the complicated topic of font rendering or rendering text within our engine. And I say this is complicated because there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of different topics that we're going to have to cover. And of course, uh, there are going to be some things that we're going to have to keep to a high surface level sort of conversation because some of these things can become pretty deep rabbit holes pretty quickly. So a couple of the topics that we're going to be covering is uh, different ways of rendering text, uh, as well as different representations of text in memory, and uh, what some of the pros and cons of each of those things are. And we're also going to uh, begin the implementation of one of those forms of uh, font rendering. So where I'm going to begin is with the representation of text in computers. So uh, at least in C, uh, if we go to our string.h, so far strings have been represented in character strings, basically, or character arrays. And uh, each individual character is represented by a character, which is a one byte um, sort of representation. Now this is a representation uh, in ASCII thus far. So um, ASCII, your basic ASCII set um, has a set of um, characters that range from ASCII codes 0 to 127, and then there's even an extended uh, ASCII character set, each one of those codes representing a specific letter in the alphabet. So uh, let me actually pull up a ASCII table real quick. I think it's ASCIItable.com actually. So to give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, this is a, <clears throat> a site that I've used um, throughout the years called ASCIItable.com, obviously because there's a table of ASCII codes here. So uh, the character representation is in red here, and uh, what we're interested in is the decimal representation of that. And so uh, you'll note that up until, really until uh, 32, um, these are all non-printing characters, or what's called non-printing characters. So um, these include things like uh, the null character, which is zero, which we've used for string termination, um, and then other various um, key codes like tabs, uh, backspaces, uh, carriage returns, line feeds. Um, so that's 10 and, and uh, what is it, 10 and 13. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, escape and, and whatnot. And so there's all sorts of um, ASCII character codes that exist that don't actually wind up getting printed. We're not going to be concerned about those. Uh, we're going to be concerned about uh, the characters that do get printed, at least for the most part. Uh, we're going to handle um, new lines and we're going to handle uh, tabs and we're gonna handle spaces, um, which actually do print. But other than that, there's not too much that we're gonna handle. Um, and so you can see here that each one of these decimal codes represents a single character. And so this system works really great. It's very convenient. Um, it is very convenient for English, um, but it's not so convenient when you start thinking about uh, other languages. Now. As I mentioned, there is the extended ASCII set that goes all the way up to 255 that gives you all these extra symbols. And this was sort of an early attempt to try and support at least some uh, European languages on some level, uh, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really cover um, what we need to cover. So, uh, you know, you have uh, characters like Japanese or Chinese that have thousands of, of uh, individual characters. You have, um, languages like German that have umlauts and stuff like that. Um, and so there's all these character codes out there that are represented that can't possibly fit into a 
character, right? Because a character really only goes up to 255 if it's not unsigned. And so when we start to think about that, we need another way besides just plain characters to represent um, to represent various characters, right? And when I say plain characters, I mean the literal C type of a character, the one byte character. And so for languages like Japanese, we have uh, something that is called a multi byte character, where we can use more than one character to represent a particular character. And so uh, we might have uh, something like, let me just change my input language here. So we might have something like um, ka in Japanese, for example, um, or, uh, you know, ko, something like that, right? This one, uh, this one character here is actually a multi-byte character. And um, it's represented, in this case, I happen to know this is a three-byte uh, representation. So this particular character is represented by three bytes of data. Uh, there are characters that are two bytes, there are characters that are four bytes, and all of this is represented by something called UTF-8. And I'm not going to go into depth on what UTF-8 is or how it works. We're just going to cover enough so that we can kind of get an understanding of a basic implementation of text in our system. And so uh, what we're going to be supporting right off the bat is obviously English. Um, and then we're going to be supporting the Asian languages, uh, the, um, I should say, the, uh, the Asian languages like Japanese, Chinese, Korean, um, any of those languages that go left to right. We are not going to be at least right off the bat supporting um, languages like Hebrew or Arabic simply because those languages are very complex to write. Not only are um, some of them right to left, which uh, includes some challenges of its own, but uh, there, are, there are also rules on the way those characters join um, based on what the characters are on either side of it. Um, and so there are sort of connecting lines that have to be made differently depending on what character is what next, next to what other character. And, and so at least for our initial implementation here, um, it's going to be fairly lightweight, fairly simple, um, and we will come back and implement those other languages in the future. And so when we're talking about UTF-8, UTF-8 is a really clever way of representing strings uh, because it just so happens that the way it's represented, because you can have single or multi-byte characters, um, ASCII characters don't change the representation. In UTF-8, uh, a ASCII character is just a single character per character, and it just it proceeds like normal. So as far as we're concerned, uh, this is ASCII, but it's also UTF-8. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, however, when you get to multi-byte characters, what you wind up doing is you start dealing with something that we're going to refer to as a code point, which I'm going to represent as a... 32-bit integer. And a code point is where you take multiple characters and you mask them and combine them together to get that 32-bit or multi-byte character out. And so in order to do this, we're going to write uh, a couple of methods uh, to be able to uh, sort of encode and decode a UTF-8 uh, in a way that we can still store it in a character array like this. But when we go to do things like string length, or we go to do things like uh, printing it out to get the actual uh, character code, instead of using the uh, character code like this, we're going to form a code point cast um, to the proper um, size, if it's just a straight cast, or uh, combine the data as need be using masks. So all that to say that our UTF-8 implementation, air quotes, if you want to call it that, is going to be rather simple and straightforward. Uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of fanciness to this. Um, and I'm going to try and keep the explanation sort of as, as top level as possible. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to uh, start in our k-string header file, and we are going to be adding two new methods. So I'm going to put these right below string length. And 
we have string UTF-8 length, which is a version of string length that analyzes each one of these characters. And if it finds a multi-byte character, which we'll see how to identify that, it will count those multiple bytes as a single character instead of um, counting every uh, byte as a character as string length does. And then we have the bytes to code point, which basically takes a, uh, a string of bytes. So this would be uh, a, a character array and then starts at a given offset within that string or array and takes in a pointer to an I32 um, where it writes a code point to, so a UTF-8 code point, and then also indicates how many bytes we have advanced within that string. So um, to go back to our example of the Japanese character, the, uh, the Ko, for example, uh, we know that this is a three byte character. And so uh, when we actually find that particular character, uh, this would wind up being three versus like an A, it would wind up being one. Okay. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so that is the two methods that we're going to be adding to this. And uh, these two methods are going to look kind of crazy, but I promise the, uh, the explanation will, will uh, hopefully clear all, all of that confusion. So uh, right here below string length, I'm going to put in our UTF-8 length implementation. And what this is going to do is it's going to loop through the string uh, until uh, it actually hits a zero character or a null terminator and then it breaks out. And what this does <clears throat> is uh, it loops through each individual byte. And it starts off by taking the byte at that I uh, sub I and converting it to a I32. So this is gonna be our code point. We're gonna call that C. So uh, if C equals zero, we, we break out of the loop. If um, C is greater than zero, which it definitely should be, um, but it's also uh, less than 127, we're going to consider that a normal ASCII character. And so uh, we're saying here that we're not going to increment again. And what I mean by increment again is we're not going to move the pointer forward at all. So here I'm saying I plus equals zero. This instruction isn't really necessary. It's just there for clarity. Um, so I could actually comment that out, um, but uh, it's basically doing this, okay? And so um, <clears throat> the purpose of, of this is merely just to check uh, that um, we aren't a normal ASCII character, right? So if we are a normal ASCII character, we can treat it as is. There's absolutely nothing else we need to do. Next, we start checking for our multi-byte characters. And we can examine the first character in the sequence uh, using a particular mask to determine how many bytes that particular character is uh, actually is. And so uh, we first check with a mask of 224 or 0xE0. And we say, if that is set to 192, right? So if, if we perform this and this <clears throat> evaluates to true, then we know that we have a double byte character, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're going to increment I, in other words, move I forward by one, okay? And if we, um, So if we, uh, if we continue here uh, and we don't pass this and we instead uh, check 240 as our mask, right? And, <clears throat> and check for 224, then we know in that case that we have a triple byte character. So that means we're gonna add I plus equals two. If we, um, if we go ahead and uh, let's see, what did I do? Right. Okay. So if we um, if we come back and uh, we haven't passed either one of these, the last thing that we'll check for is a four byte character. Um, and so uh, in this case, we check with a mask of two forty eight against two forty. And if that's the case, uh, we increment by three more. So what we're doing is we're moving that many more. Uh, characters 
um, up the string, okay? And so the reason that we're doing that is if you look in our loop here, we are incrementing i for every character, right? So for a single byte character, we only need to increment it once. For double byte, we increment it twice, which is why we're adding one. Triple byte, we're adding two. Four byte, we're adding three. We're also incrementing our length on every loop. So what this is doing is uh, for a double byte character, for example, we're moving forward in the loop by two characters, but we're only counting that as a single character when it comes to our length. And so we move through the entire string that way. And these characters can be mixed. So we can have any combination of uh, single or multi-byte characters in a string. And uh, based on those things, we will only count each actual character uh, or code point once. One thing I do want to mention here is uh, there are five and six byte characters, um, but we are not going to be supporting those. Um, I don't think it's common enough to make it worth supporting. Um, and we're going to return this as invalid UTF-8 or zero. So if we get a string UTF-8 length of zero, um, and we know that the string is not actually empty, then we know that we have a problem with the string. Now, um, I suppose what we could do is uh, since we have, I believe we have the logger here, do we not? No, we don't have the logger. I suppose what we could do is, is, uh, is potentially log this. So I'll say to do logging, right? Uh, we might wanna do that in like debug builds or something like that, but I don't think we're ever gonna really hit this unless we have some sort of weird corrupt data. Anyway, um, so once we have traversed the entire um, the entire array until we actually hit a, uh, a null terminator, we just return the length, right? And so this is how we deal with multi-byte characters. We basically use this series of masks to determine if it's a multi-byte character and then treat it as such if it is. All right, so that is that function. And the next function that we're going to add is uh, our definition, rather, for our uh, bytes to code point. And this one's a little bit more complex, but it actually looks more complex than it actually really is. So um, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we are going to take in bytes and offset just like we had before. Um, and we are going to uh, first cast that uh, to a I32 code point. So we're going to take bytes sub offset, cast that. And we're going to do the same checks here uh, against the code point as we had up here, right? So you'll see that these uh, masks are all the same. It's just what we do within each one of those uh, cases is a little bit different. So um, for normal single byte ASCII characters, we're going to set out advance to one and we're going to uh, put the out code point as just code point. So in other words, we're just gonna spit it out as is and uh, not really think too much of it otherwise. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and return true. Um, I should point out that this returns uh, a Boolean here, not a, a length because the out advances are, are sort of um, our length. Anyway, uh, so the way that we treat double byte characters is we actually take the bytes from the offset uh, plus zero, which I have plus zero in here just to kind of make things line up and make it a little bit more clear as to what's going on. So we take that and we mask it using a binary mask of 31. And we're basically just flipping uh, these bits, right? And then we shift that by six bits. Um, and then we go ahead and we add that to bytes, which is sub offset plus one and then use a mask on that, which you can see here is 63. And so we add these two together, right? And uh, that gives us our final code point. So our UTF-8 code point. Uh, and then we can use that to look up um, in a table to see what actual character we should render. We'll come back to that. So in this case, we set our out advance to two and our uh, out code point is code point. Um, and that's always going to be the case, right? Uh, because in, in fact, we could probably, um, we could probably simplify this code a little bit and make it a little bit less repetitive, but, um, we're always going to set the out advance and out code point, right? So in this case, we also return true. Triple byte character looks very similar. Uh, the only difference is, is, uh, we take the, 
uh, zero uh, offset, the one offset, and the two offset, which I don't know why these things have extra spaces in them. Anyway, um, but this time we shift the uh, first character by 12 uh, bytes, or bits rather. Uh, we shift the second character by six, and then we shift the third character by none. Um, and the masks for that are 15, 63. Oops. And, yeah, and 63. Right? And so um, by applying it in this way, we get a triple byte character down to a single code point. And then uh, the four byte character is actually done pretty much as you might expect at this point, um, where we shift the first character by 18 bits the second character by 12 bits, the third character by six bits, and the last character by zero bits, uh, applying masks as necessary. So we have seven, 63 for the rest of these, okay? Uh, and obviously the out advance is set uh, accordingly, as well as the out code point, and we return true. Now, if there's anything else, um, we are not supporting five and six byte characters, as we've mentioned before. Um, in fact, I am spitting out a message here. Hmm. I wonder if one of these other ones has. The logger. I'll bet DRA does. No, it doesn't. All right, well, we actually need to include our logger. So let me actually do that. Um, And instead of leaving that as a to-do, since I have an error here, I'm just going to do this, change the function name. There we go. Okay, so, um, so anyway, uh, in the event of invalid UTF-8, we will set out advance to zero and out code point to zero, bleat about it, and then return false. Okay, so that is everything that we need to do to represent UTF-8 in the system, at least for now. Um, there are gonna be other things that uh, we are gonna have to do, but I think uh, for right now, uh, that should suffice. So the, the next thing that uh, we need to do is go into kmemory.h, and we'll go here uh, all the way to the bottom, and we actually have a couple new uh, tags that we need to add, uh, memory tags. So we have our GPU local right below that. We have bitmap fonts and system fonts. And so this is actually where I'm going to um, pause for a second and discuss what these things mean. Uh, right after I actually put this in kmemory.c. Let me get this in here too so I don't forget. Okay, so we have something called bitmap fonts and we have something called system fonts. Um, what is the difference between these two? What are they? So um, in classic games, uh, pretty much since, uh, since games have been around, uh, we have always sort of pre-rendered text to a bitmap and then rendered um, sections of that text um, out to the screen. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I actually have imported um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of files here uh, with some font information. And so we always wind up with something that looks a little bit like this. And I'm gonna zoom in, I know this is gonna be a little bit blurry, but it is what it is. And so uh, this is the, the Ubuntu mono font rendered at 21 pixels. And so what we have here is these aren't in any particular order, but you'll notice that each individual character and some of the symbols and whatnot has its own individual space. And um, they're all sort of jumbled and, and sort of um, put in here in such a way where uh, they fit into the bitmap as economically as possible, right? And we do have some empty space down here and that's fine. So the way that this works is we say, okay, I need a capital A. Well, let me go uh, to this image and pull out uh, this square right here and render that uh, to a polygon. Uh, okay, now I need uh, 
the, the number four. So let me cut out this box here and render that to a polygon. And then uh, maybe, you know, the D to a polygon or something like that. And it basically just goes through uh, this particular uh, texture and samples it at all these different points and puts that onto a polygon a quad, right? And so typically with bitmap fonts, you also have some sort of meta information that goes with this where um, you have uh, text information that gets... Uh, you know, output in a certain format so that you can actually say, okay, well, I need um, the letter A. Where do I go in this for that? And so we have something called these FNT files. And I'll show you guys how to generate these in just a second, but let me get rid of this. And so um, let me actually do this one. Here we go. And so uh, this is what uh, one of those bitmap font file definitions looks like. So this is all the metadata that we have here, right? So we have uh, a negative one here, which is sort of uh, our code point for an unknown character. But then you'll notice that we start at 32, which is a space. And then uh, if we go to 65 here, uh, which I happen to know is capital A, we can see here that we have an X of 47 and a Y of 16. So uh, if I go back to our texture here, uh, let me find it. So right here, let me zoom this in a little bit. Um, does this actually tell me? I may have to open this in a different editor. Give me one second to do that. So let's see, we'll open this with, um, I guess I'll open this with GIMP. So <clears throat> we have this file here, right? And uh, our Our position here is basically this. This is our rectangle, right? So we have an X and Y, a width and a height. And so um, I'm just gonna move this off to the side real quick so that we can find this. So uh, our definition of A is at 47, 16. So if we go here, we can see these coordinates down here. And if you watch this portion of the screen, so we have 47 and then 16 is going to be up uh, this way, right? 16, 40, 47. Okay. And so uh, that's going to be right about right there. And so if we draw a box, that is, uh, we can see the, the rectangle there uh, that is 10 wide and 12 high. If I can do this here, we will note that we have perfectly outlined the letter A, okay? And so uh, we can use uh, this by identifying the code point to get that rectangle. Now, there are some other properties here. There are X offset, Y offset, X advance, page, and channel. So some of these matter, some of them don't. So um, what we're gonna do is take a quick look at some of these things. So our X offset is basically an offset in the X direction, right? So it's uh, some additional um, offset information that is separate from the actual rectangle itself. So it's basically how much we need to offset by. Same with, uh, same with Y. Uh, the X advance is how many pixels essentially this particular character causes us to go forward in a string of characters. And so um, in this example, uh, we have uh, 10 for all of these characters because this is a monospace font. Um, so everything here is 10. So this is a relatively simple font, right? Um, there's not a whole heck of a lot here. This file isn't very long at all. Um, and uh, you know, this is pretty easy to parse. However, uh, there are more complicated fonts involved. So I've actually generated uh, another one here. And I, again, I will show you guys how to generate this in just a second. Uh, so this is another font definition um, called Noto Sans uh, that I've rendered at 21 pixels. And I'm actually going to pull up the bitmap for that as well. So I'm gonna open this with 
And this is going to be a little bit hard to see. And I've not um, done this one in the most um, the most efficient pattern. But what we can see here is not a whole heck of a lot, right? This is um, this looks like a mess. That's because this image is actually huge. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is a 4K texture, and what we've rendered here is not only every um, every file or every uh, every letter from A to Z, lower and uppercase, but we've also done a whole bunch of Chinese characters, right? And when I was saying there were thousands of Chinese and Japanese characters, I was not kidding. So um, to make this a little bit more clear, let me, um, let me add a new layer. And move it down here and go to paint buckets. And I guess I'll fill this with black. So that should allow us to see what's going on. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what we have here, if we zoom out a little bit, now you can kind of see um, how many characters we are actually dealing with, right? And a lot of these look like they're the same characters, but they're really not. Um, and so there are thousands upon thousands of these characters here, right? And this is everything that is basically rendered into one single file. And I think uh, all the uh, Roman letters are all here at the bottom, right? There's some Japanese letters down here too, um, some katakana and hiragana. Um, we even have the Japanese repetition character that's there. Um, we've got all kinds of uh, individual symbols. And basically what I've done is uh, this is an example of a um, what they call a uh, CJK uh, file, which is Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And so uh, this contains um, all three of those languages, uh, at least the most common characters of them. Um, and so we can see here that uh, we have Chinese characters here at the top. Uh, the Korean ones are like in here. Uh, let's see. These look like Korean characters to me, like all these ones. Um, and then there are Japanese characters like down here. Um, and over to the side, over here, right? And so we basically rendered all these to a gigantic texture. And so as you can imagine, um, this works, right? But there's also a lot of uh, languages that aren't included in this, right? Like, right, uh, like Arabic isn't actually included in this language. Hebrew isn't included. There's, there's a whole bunch of languages that aren't actually included in this. Um, and I don't know that there is one single font out there that will cover all of those. Um, I haven't researched it, to be fair. And so um, the problem with a, a bitmap font is you wind up having huge textures like this uh, that you have to load up into memory, and most of these characters you'll never wind up using, right? But they're here if you need them. And so um, not only do we have a huge texture, but we also have a huge definition here um, in the uh, bitmap font definition, the FNT file. Um, and so if we look through this and just scroll through it real quickly, look how many character definitions we have, right? I'm still scrolling through it, right? Um, so we have, let me see, let me just scroll to the bottom of the list here. All right. So um, we have, you know, character codes all the way up to 200,000s, which is why you need, um, you know, multi-byte situations, right? Uh, in this case, we're only supporting four bytes, hence the 32-bit integer. Um, but that's why uh, we need this, right? Because even um, even a 16-bit a integer isn't enough to actually hold all this. So um, anyway, so uh, we have all these characters, but then we also, uh, for non-monospace fonts, we also have something called kernings. So... Um, just to illustrate what that is real quick, I've pulled up uh, this graphic, uh, which is from freetype.org. Um, and this kind of uh, tells us a little bit of uh, some of the terminology that is used when rendering fonts. And this, some of this is going to be important. Some of it's kind of not going to be. Um, so we have uh, an X min and max, um, which we can uh, extract from the actual uh, rectangle itself. We have the width. Um, and then we have the height, which includes the entire height of the character. 
Uh, we have a bearing X, which is the space between the origin um, and uh, the actual where the actual character's width is. And then a bearing Y, which is based off the origin, which is, uh, you can think of that as the line of text, right? So for a G like this, that goes below uh, the line. If you're thinking like a college rule paper or something like that, the G kind of goes below the line. Um, that's what this is. So the bearing Y is basically uh, that difference there. And then uh, we have our advance, which in this case is our X advance. Um, obviously this is going to the right. If we had a right to left language, it would go to the left. Um, and then uh, the other bits, which I actually don't see. Um, in fact, kerning is not actually even on this. So uh, let's see. Kerning, let me see if I can find a quick graphic for that. Uh, actually, this is a pretty good graphic right here. So um, let me blow this up. Um, Open image a new tab. Here we go. All right. So kerning is a special property of uh, various letters that defines how much space there should be between two specific letters. In this case, we're using A and V. And then this other case, we're using W and A. And so in this case, uh, we have a negative kerning. So this would be a negative value to make sure that the V scooch, scooches over um, and sort of overlaps the A here. And so um, you may have negative values, you may have positive values for kerning, but it basically uh, it further adjusts the uh, spacing of the uh, characters between each other. Um, uh, it, it further modifies that, I should say. And so we have this kerning for non-monospace fonts. Um, which has a definition for a first character and a second character. It says if these characters come in this sequence, uh, this is the amount of kern kerning to apply. So we can see if we have here um, uh, character 47 and then character code 238, whatever that is, uh, the amount of kerning is one. Uh, if we have 12,360 is the first character and the second character is 12,390, we have a negative one kerning. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of various kernings here. Uh, most of them seem to be uh, negative one or one. Here's one that's negative two. Uh, here's a couple more that are negative two. And so um, this is a further modification uh, that we can use to make the text look a little bit more proper um, when we're rendering it out. So um, all of these things will actually need to be parsed from this particular file. And so, um, with that said, we should probably have a quick look into how do we generate uh, these files, right? Because some of you may know this, but it is not uh, something that I expect you to know. And so we are going to use a program called BM Font. It's from angelcode.com. I've used it for a number of years. It is technically a Windows application. Uh, there are uh, There is a, a Java equivalent, I think, that's called, I want to say it's called Hero. Um, that does run on Linux, uh, but I'm just more familiar with this application. And so I just uh, go ahead and download this and run it uh, using Wine. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I already have it downloaded here uh, to my downloads, BM font uh, 1.14a. And so I could just uh, look here and I can literally say Wine uh, BM font 64.exe. Launch that. And here we are. And so um, I actually have uh, that um, CJK file loaded up right now. Um, and so it contains all sorts of character definitions in here. Um, so I'm actually gonna switch away from this one by going to options, uh, font settings. And I'm gonna change the font to, let's go with, um, let's go with Ubuntu, let's go back to Ubuntu uh, mono. Let's actually keep this simple. Okay, um, and what we're gonna do here is uh, you can actually determine whether you wanna use Unicode um, or if you wanna use like OEM ANSI or one of these other. I don't recommend using these. Um, these are sort of antiquated. Uh, I would stick with Unicode. Here's where you set the font size. So I'm gonna leave this at 21. Um, I'm not gonna actually generate one of these things, but I'm gonna show you sort of how to do it. Um, 
the thing that we want to do, uh, we want to make sure that uh, font smoothing is on uh, because that'll give us uh, nice, clear, smooth looking characters. Um, we can put an outline if we want to. I'm not going to do that, um, but we can. So we set up uh, whatever font that we want to use. And then uh, we can also go to export options. And we can add additional padding to the characters if we want. Now, I'm not going to do this for now, but when we, uh, when we go to actually implement uh, the sign distance field uh, text rendering, which is a hint of what's to come for those of you who know what that is, um, we're going to actually need to leverage that. But for right now, um, we don't need to. And so uh, you can also set the texture width here. Uh, I'm going to bump this down to 128. Um, actually, yeah, 128 might work. Um, I'm going to leave it with a bit depth of 32 because we deal with 32-bit 32 text 32 textures everywhere. Um, we could optimize this a bit and use an 8-bit texture. Um, but, I mean we're not really going to be saving that much space. Um, and it just kind of makes it a pain in the butt. And ultimately we have to convert it to 32 bit under the hood anyway. So I, we might as well just use 32 bit. The default for this is, uh, the alpha will hold the outline. Um, and then RGB will hold the glyph. Um, and then, uh, we want to, as far as our file format, we want to use the text format. There is an XML and binary option. Um, but, uh, we are going to be rolling our own binary definition. So we don't want to use their binar binary. This is basically for an import only. And so um, we are going to use the text option. And then for the textures, uh, note that that's plural. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, there are different options available here. You could use DDS or target if you want. I'm going to stick with PNG. Um, and then compression, the only thing is, that's available here is deflate, and that's fine. So, um, with all that said, uh, oops, I need to actually save my changes there. So 128, 128, um, and everything else is fine. Okay. So, um, once you've done that, you actually have to go through here and choose the, uh, symbols that you want. Now you can click the individual code pages if that's what you want to do. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to select all of these and right click and unselect mark subset, right? Because the only thing that we want, we actually want to use for this is just this simple subset of characters, which is just considered quote unquote Latin. And, uh, in this case, uh, it's not actually going to output, uh, some of these, uh, other non printing characters. That's what all these are up here. Um, so you'll notice these are in rows of 16. We have two of those. So that's all the way up to uh, from zero to 31. Those are the non-printing ASCII characters. And then we have a space character here. Uh, so anything that's dark gray is not gonna be exported. Anything that's gray is gonna be exported, right? And so um, these ones uh, basically just don't export whatsoever. These particular ones do, but they don't show us anything. So we're just gonna leave them deselected. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is, uh, in order to actually generate this, um, we need to go to save bitmap font as. And uh, when we do that, it'll ask us uh, to name an FNT file. Uh, we've already done this, so I'm not gonna do that, but what it's gonna do is it's going to spit out um, the FNT file and then a PNG file right next to that. Um, and in that case, it's going to uh, generate the both the FNT file and our texture. Um, and then you have to pick up the texture and move it into uh, the assets textures folder. Now I've already done that here, so I'm not gonna repeat that. Um, but if we wanna get an idea of what the font looks like without having to actually generate it, uh, there is a way that we can do that, and that is the visualize. So if we click visualize, we will get a little preview all the way up here in the corner of what it is gonna look like. And uh, I think you can zoom in, yeah. So let's zoom in four times, right? And so uh, this gives us a, a nice little layout here of what uh, all the glyphs are gonna look like when they are actually exported. And it gives us little green boxes so that we can visualize that real well. Um, and so, um, whoops, one to four. I don't know why you would wanna zoom it out that far, I guess if you have a, a large one. But we can see here that uh, everything is, is reasonably tightly packed here. And this looks exactly like uh, what we have um, in our already generated file. So I'm gonna stick with that file and I'm not gonna use this file, but if I did need to, 
um, I would go ahead and export this and save it. So once you do that, uh, you are given this FNT file and then the uh, texture files like what I have here, right? So it looks familiar. All right, and so that's how you generate bitmap fonts. Okay, so uh, at this point, I think we are done with the theoreticals and can actually move on to some implementation stuff. So I'm going to uh, close this. I'm going to close this one. I am gonna keep this open for reference. So uh, we know what all these properties are, right? Um, the, uh, all the way up until the page. Oh, that was one more thing that I forgot to, to cover. Crap. All right, um, let me open back BM font. So, um, font settings. Let's crank this up to like font size of 48. All right, but we still have our export options set to 128 pixel texture, okay? When we go to visualize, we can now see that obviously not everything fits into that individual texture, right? And you'll notice up here in the preview window, it says one of four. That means that this has been split into what four pages is what they're called. And if I use the arrow keys, I can sort of go back and forth through all these so that we can see how these are generated. And so at least for our implementation, um, we're gonna put some references to the page in there, but we're not really gonna support multi-page uh, fonts right out of the box. Um, so what we're gonna need to do is, is uh, when you generate these fonts, you wanna make sure that uh, the texture size is such that everything can actually be fit into um, a single page. So in this case, uh, we could try cranking this up to 256 by 256, right, and visualize again. And we see now that uh, everything fits onto one page. We have preview one of one, um, and we're all on one page. So um, that is what this page property is right here. Um, so everything here is on page zero. So um, if we if we had uh, more than one page, um, we would have more than one page line here pointing to a different texture, okay? All right, uh, so let's see. The next thing um, that we could cover here is this channel. Um, and this is actually um, a bitwise uh, added integer for the RGBA channels um, as to what they're, which ones are actually included and which ones are not. Um, we could use this if we were using like a single channel texture. Um, we could use this as an optimization to um, go ahead and um, convert that or do whatever we needed to do to work with a single or multi-channel multi texture. Uh, however, since we're using 32-bit for everything, uh, four channels, we are simply going to ignore that for now. We'll read it in, but we're not gonna do anything with it. So um, what we're gonna be concerned with reading is uh, all these individual lines, line by line, and each one of these lines has a sort of header. Uh, and then uh, that tells us what kind of line it is. Um, so we have an info line that gives us like the font face, uh, what the font size is, whether or not it's bold and italic, which we're not actually gonna pay attention to that. Um, but if we wanted to in the future, we certainly could read that in. Uh, character set, which again, uh, I'm not going to pay attention to that. I'm just gonna assume uh, that everything is Unicode. Um, the stretch H um, and actually, Yes, so stretch H, uh, I forget what that property is actually for. Doesn't really matter, I ignore it anyway. Uh, smoothing and anti-aliasing are both sets of one. Um, again, uh, I'm going to ignore those. Uh, padding is uh, is nothing, so again, I'm going to ignore it. Same with spacing and outline. Um, I'm not gonna read in those properties. So really, uh, the only thing I'm gonna read in is the font face and the size, and everything else is basically gonna be ignored for now. The common line tells us what the uh, font's line height is. Uh, the base, if we want it, uh, we're not gonna need it right away, but if we want it, it's there. Uh, the scale W and H, so that's width and height, that gives us the size of the texture. 
uh, in pixels. So it's 128 by 128. All of these will be the same size. So that's really important to know um, when we go to convert some of this stuff to texture coordinates. Um, the number of pages is one, which matches up with what we have here. So that will tell us um, how big the array for pages needs to be. Pack to zero, um, alpha channel, uh, we do have that. Um, and then uh, the red, green channel, blue channel uh, are all set to zero. I forget exactly what those represent. There is documentation. I don't care though, because I'm not using it. Uh, so we have the page here, the ID, that's the, uh, the number that lines up with the page ID that is assigned to each individual character record. Uh, the file, which is the uh, texture itself. Um, when you generate one of these, it may actually have a absolute path or at least a relative path. Um, but the way that we're gonna set up the system, uh, we should only have a file name here. So um, make sure that you uh, validate that that is not um, a full path, but just a file name. Cares basically just tells us what the number of characters in the file is, right? And so we have a count of 96. So we know how big the array is uh, gonna have to be to hold the character definitions. So the care line, which is separate from cares. So the care line is what contains our definition for each individual character. We've been over those properties already. And then uh, this particular file does not actually include any kerning information, again, because it's monospace. Um, it doesn't actually have kerning information. However, um, let's see. Let me get to the right spot in this file. So uh, this larger Noto Sans file uh, does have kernings. And so we can use this as an example of, of uh, loading those up. And so just like the character, um, the cares line, we have a kernings line, which again has a count and it tells us how many of those kerning definitions we have. This file has 3,244. So we know how big that array should be. Um, and then the kerning just uh, contains a kerning definition for um, each record. So uh, we have the first character code and the second character code of the two characters that are combined. And then of course the amount, which needs to be a signed uh, integer because they can be positive or negative. And then if we go down here to the bottom of the file, it's just kernings. So that is what we need to uh, ultimately process. So um, with that said, I think, uh, let me just check a couple things here. Um, so I wanna add and fix just a couple minor things before we actually jump into the meat and potatoes of the code. And so um, in file system H, I wanna write a utility macro to close if failed. And basically what this is gonna do is it's going to analyze the output of a function uh, as a Boolean. And uh, if that uh, function returns false, then uh, the file handle or the handle that's passed to a file is going to be closed via file system close. And then we're also going to um, bleat about it. So we're gonna say some, some file operation failed. And then we're gonna return false. So it's really important that the caller of this has a couple things in place. And I put this in the comments. Um, it must, the file must include core logger H, obviously for this logger call. And then um, obviously the calling function that includes this has to return a Boolean because of this, okay? So just a couple things to note there. Uh, and I also wanna fix a small uh, math bug that someone pointed out. So uh, the vector four zero, uh, the comment for it, states it's a three component vector for um, vector four zero and vector four one. So I'll just change those comments real quick. Easy peasy. And the next thing I think we probably ought to jump into is, hmm, let's actually do some resource types. So I already have that open here. I'm gonna go all the way to the top and we're gonna add a new resource type. And this is going to be um, of type bitmap font. So we're gonna have a specific resource loader for bitmap fonts. And um, 
we're going to start modifying our loaders um, to use something um, in our, at least our proprietary binary formats to use an identifier um, to let us know that it's actually a Kohi binary file and not some other sort of rubbish that's being inserted. And so what we're going to do is we're going to define a resource magic uh, macro that is basically the uh, integer 0x cafe babe. Um, and this is a just a, a hexadecimal uh, number that you can use that is, is uh, unique. And this works because, uh, you know, these go up to, uh, these are base 16. So um, you can go all the way up to, uh, you know, from zero to nine and then from A to F. And all those characters here are that. So uh, here we have, uh, you know, this is, three four zero five six nine um one five eight two and so this is a um a magic character that we're going to use in our binary files um going forward and probably i'm going to retrofit these uh to our existing binary formats as well and so the first one of the first things that's going to look for is the existence of that in the file to make sure that um you know it's it's actually a cohe binary file now there there are others of these too there's like a zero x uh dead beef um there's all kinds of of other uh, clever names that people have made but this is always the one that sticks in my mind so that's that's the one i'm going to roll with um and then we're going to have something called a resource header um, which is going to be uh, four binary resource types uh, it's going to include the magic number which is this uh, it's basically always going to be that um, it's going to include the resource type, so this guy here. Uh, it's going to include a version, which is just a U8. Um, really, I can't picture us having versions beyond, um, you know, 255 versions. That'd be kind of ridiculous. Um, and then um, we're also going to reserve a U16 worth of space for future header data, um, just in case we we need to um, expand something or maybe expand this to a U16. Um, then we can collapse this to U8, something like that, or to add another field here, whatever we need to do. Um, and so this allows us to also have uh, this whole thing. Um, basically, we have uh, you know four bytes and then another four bytes between these guys. So we have an eight-byte structure here. Okay, So it's nice and square, as it were. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to go down to where the texture map is defined. Uh, right here and right after that we are going to insert some new structures and this is going to be for our font parsing so um, there's going to be several of these we'll walk through them real quick so the first thing that we're going to have is something called a font glyph and a glyph um, can have a bunch of different meanings depending on um, where you look it up but our definition of a glyph is for now going to be an individual character so it's going to have that code point that we talked about, um, our UTF-8 code point. It's going to um, give an X and a Y, a width and a height. Uh, these are all in uh, in pixels. Uh, this is going to have an X offset, a Y offset, an X advance, and a page ID. So this is essentially a one-to-one -one mapping of our font files. Let me collapse this real quick. So this is a one-to-one -one mapping to a character record here essentially. And so um, we have that um, and we're going to use that uh, both actually for our bitmap fonts and our system fonts, which I haven't gone into what system fonts are. Um, and I might touch on that at the end of the video or in the next video, we'll see. Uh, the next we have our kerning, um, our font kerning, which is just a kerning definition. So we have uh, code point zero and code point one, and then the amount. And then we have a font type, which is bitmap or system. And then we have uh, some font data here. Uh, and this is the sort of top level uh, data for the particular font. So we have the font type, uh, the name of the font face, which is uh, right now uh, has a maximum of 256 characters. Um, and I did that just to keep the, set, the uh, size of this struct um, uh, nice and even. Um, inexact. 
So uh, we also have the font size, the line height, the baseline, uh, the atlas size, X and Y. So that's the texture size of the atlas that's used to calculate um, our texture coordinates when we're cutting out those boxes out of our out of our texture to um, you know put them on a quad. Uh, and then uh, we have our texture map to our texture atlas itself. Um, and so uh, this is the reason right here that we are supporting one page is because we have one texture map. Uh, we could have multiple texture maps of multiple atlases, but I think that's kind of dumb. Um, we could just make everything fit into one single atlas and then we're good. Um, we also have a glyph count, a font glyph array, a kerning count, and a uh, kerning uh, font kerning array. We have what's called a tab X advance, which is something that we are going to um, probably hard code initially because that's uh, something that uh, isn't really defined. Uh, we might wind up actually using um, something out of the font file if it exists and if it doesn't use a hard coded value. Um, based on the font size, but anyway. Um, and then we're going to have some internal data and internal data size. Uh, and this is going to be the uh, renderer API specific data, um, the resources that are needed. So like the Vulkan resources that are going to be needed uh, for a, a font will be stored in here. Um, and then the size of that will be uh, stored here, right? Just so that uh, we can allocate and free that memory without having to know sort of the internals of it. Next, we have a bitmap font page, which is just a mapping of the individual page itself. So in this case, it's just an ID and a file. Um, and so this is the texture file that'll be loaded. And then we have a bitmap uh, font resource data. So this is going to be the font data that gets loaded, the page count, and then the array of pages. Um, and of course, these pages will um, have uh, ultimately all of this information and all of this information. And all of this stuff will be sort of combined into uh, this resource data structure, which we can then use when we're actually rendering the text. Okay, so that is it for our resource types. Uh, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're actually going to implement the loader. Um, and so under resources loaders, I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna call this uh, bitmap font loader.h and this like our other loaders is going to be really simple and basically it's just going to um, it's basically just going to contain uh, the bitmap font resource loader create um, and of course include the resource system h uh, to get this definition here. So that is all that is gonna be um, in the loader. So uh, before I actually create the C file though, I'm going to go ahead uh, to the resource system. So resource system uh, dot C. And I'm gonna to go to the top here and I'm just going to add our bitmap font loader right here. And then uh, go ahead and uh, call for it to be stood up down here just before I forget to actually do that and then wonder why it doesn't work. So we've got that. Uh, and then um, really the, the last uh, big piece of this, at least for this video, is going to be the loader itself. So um, I think the way that I'm gonna do this is sort of uh, just from the top down. So let me create the new file first. So bitmap font loader oops dot c and uh, i'm going to include um, all of the headers that we're going to need and so we need the bitmap font loader obviously we need the logger um, k memory k string um, our resource types our resource system uh, our loader utils platform file system to get file access and then we're also going to need stdio uh, dot h for uh, s scanf um, this is something I'd eventually like to replace with our sort of own version of that, but that is a rabbit hole I don't want to go down for right now. So for right now, I'm going to use that um, and maybe I'll replace it down, down the road. So uh, the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to have a, um, an enumeration for the bitmap file 
bitmap font file type. So uh, this is basically going to represent um, the types of files that we can deal with. So first off, um, if we have like a, uh, an unknown type, um, we're just going to call that not found. Um, and then we're going to have um, a KBF, which is a Kohi uh, bitmap font binary file. Um, so that's going to be our um, extension for that. So we are going to be having sort of our own uh, binary file that we're going to write out um, and be able to load that so we don't have to read that text file every single time. Uh, so we'll implement that last. Um, and then, of course, we have the file type FNT, which is just that text file that we've reviewed already. And so um, we will have the ability to load either one of these types of files. And basically, the way that's going to work is if the KBF exists, it'll load that. Otherwise, it will fall back to an FNT file. Next, uh, we have um, another small structure, which is a supported bitmap font file type, uh, which just has a small character array for the extension. Uh, it includes the type um, enumeration here, and then it includes whether or not it is a binary file. Um, and this usage will come, become apparent uh, very shortly here. So we're going to have a few definitions or declarations, I should say, for some files here. Uh, we're going to have one for import FNT file. So FNT files are going to be imported um, during the final runtime or publishing of a game. You're not going to be shipping FNT files. You're going to be shipping KBF files. So uh, we're going to we're going to refer to that as an import when we open one of those files. Um, we're also going to be reading a KBF file and we're going to be writing a KBF file. So whenever we import an FNT file, that is going to chain onto writing out a KBF file um, with that bitmap font resource data. And so it'll automatically write out that resource. That way, the next time you load the engine, it's actually just going to um, go ahead and use that KBF file that was generated uh, previously. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to implement is obviously the bitmap font loader load. Um, so this is the load function that we are going to use. And um, we're first off going to want a format string uh, to build out the path. And we're going to want to declare a file handle. And now we're going to sort of put together our supported extensions. And for this, I'm just going to inline define supported file type count two because we have KBF files and we have FNT files. And what we're going to do is we are just going to say supported bitmap font file type, supported file types of this size. So an array of two of those. The first type is going to be the KBF file. So that's going to be, that's on the top because that's the first one we're going to try. And then we'll fall back to an FNT file. So here is that uh, extension uh, string for those, KBF and FNT. Uh, here is the file type, so KBF and FNT. And then the KBF is binary, the FNT is not. And we will uh, wind up uh, using that um, to determine um, what type of file we're going to load and how to treat it. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and build out a file path, right? And so we are going to try each of our supported extensions. So our full file path is limited to 512 characters. I don't think this is going to be a problem. Um, if it is, we can always bump it up uh, if you guys run into an issue with that. But 512 should be enough. Uh, mainly because I just want to keep it on the stack, right? I don't want to allocate memory for that. That's dumb. So uh, we have uh, a default file type of not found. And then we're going to basically loop through our supported file types. And we are going to do a string format on full file path using the format string we declared up here. Um, getting the uh, resource system's base, base path, the type path of this loader, which we haven't actually defined yet, but we will um, in a bit, uh, the name of the resource, and then the supported file type sub i dot extension. So it's basically going to put all that together and build out a string and then say, does that exist? Does that file actually exist? And if it does, we are going to um, open it as a binary file. And we are going to set the type to supported file type sub i 
dot type and then break. Okay. And then by the time we get down here, we're going to do a check to say, well, uh, is the type still set to file type not found? If it is, we're going to bleat about that. Say we can't find a bitmap font of a supported type called blah, 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 and then return false and uh, we're done. If we do find it, uh, then we can go ahead and start reading slash processing it. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do here is um, basically uh, duplicate the full path into the resource, right? Because this full file path is only on the stack, right? So at this point, it's safe to go ahead and say, okay, we'll take a copy of the string that is dynamically allocated um, and store it in full path, which is just a character array. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, our resource data. So we're gonna stand up some resource data here. Um, and then uh, the resource data dot data, which is our font data. Uh, the, the font type is going to be bitmap, okay? Next, we are going to switch on the type and we're going to uh, set a result here. And we're going to basically look at uh, the different file types, right? And so the first one we're going to look at is the FNT type, okay? And so before we can actually um, even read in the FNT file, we are gonna generate a, whoops, that should be a KBF file name. And uh, why is that? Yeah, let me rename that too. KBF file name. Okay, and so uh, basically, uh, we are going to uh, generate the same path, but as if it were a KBF here at the end. So we're basically gonna repeat this logic up here at the top, um, but instead of using the extension here, we're just gonna hard code that to KBF. That is gonna be used in our call to import the FNT file. And so this import is going to take uh, obviously a handle to the file itself. And then the out uh, KBF file name is going to be passed here. And then uh, the out resource data is gonna be passed here. So um, it's going to know ahead of time to say, hey, uh, once I'm done importing this, uh, we need to write out a binary file um, at uh, this location. And then of course it sets result to that and we will break, okay? So that's the FNT process. If we have a KBF, it's actually stupidly simple. So all it does is call read KBF file. And then uh, if for some reason we still have gotten to this point and it's not found, um, we're gonna go ahead and put an error out and say result equals false and then break. Um, in fact, Yeah, we don't want to return here because we are going to have a memory leak if we do that. So yeah, okay. So we'll go ahead and fall through. Um, and at this point, uh, we will have processed the file, um, whether it's through importing it or reading uh, the KBF file. So we're safe to go ahead and close the file. And then if result is false, meaning we had some failure, which would be this essentially, um, at that point, we go ahead and say, hey, we failed to process the bitmap font file again. Um, we set uh, out resource data to zero and data size to zero and return false. Uh, we probably should also, we should probably also um, call string free on, uh, what was that? Um, out resource full path, full path, and move this up here. Right, okay. So uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, not leak that memory. And then uh, from there, we'll go ahead and, uh, if we're successful, we'll go ahead and set the out resource data to um, a newly allocated um, resource tag. Um, and then we'll go ahead and do a, a memory copy um, of the resource data that we've read in. 
to out resource uh, data, right? So that's just to that void pointer that we just uh, allocated memory to. And then uh, we'll go ahead and set the data size to size of bitmap font resource data. If all of this is successful, we will return true. And uh, that is all there is, um, at least to the high level operation of this. That's how that works um, on, on the high level, okay? Now, um, the unload is basically going to wind up uh, undoing anything that is done um, in the uh, either load scenario. So either way, we're gonna be uh, filling out one of those uh, resource um, structures. And so I'm just gonna paste this in because this is pretty self-explanatory, I feel like. So we navigate the self and the resource. Uh, if we have resource data, then we say, okay, cold cast that to our known type. Um, if we have a glyph count and we have a glyphs array, then we go ahead and free that array and set the glyphs to zero. Do the same thing for kerning, same thing for pages. Uh, we free the resource data, we zero everything out. Um, and then if we have uh, the full path here, we go ahead and uh, free that as well. So uh, not too much fanciness there. All things we have seen before. Okay. So the next thing we're gonna do is uh, a just a small um, verify line macro, which is basically gonna take the line type, the line number, the expected, and the actual. Um, and this is basically going to indicate to us how many elements we read from that line. So uh, the line type will be essentially this first word here. Um, and then uh, the line number, of course, will be the line number in the file. Uh, this will be the expected number of elements that we read. So an element in this case will be, you know, one of these things. Each of these will be an element, right? Um, and then uh, the actual will be passed through as well. So um, if expected and actual do not match for some reason, then it's going to say, hey, um, the file is foobar. Um, we expected this, but only read this, and then return false, okay? Um, and again, this is gonna be called from a function that uh, returns a Boolean. Okay, so. Let me just Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and set up our import logic. Uh, that's gonna be the most important thing that we're gonna set up uh, at first. So we have our import FNT file. And essentially what we're gonna do is a bunch of setup and then we're gonna loop through this line by line. So um, I'm actually just gonna kind of go through this chunk by chunk and we'll kind of tackle this section by section. So we zero out the memory of our out data. Um, we create a line buffer that's 512 characters long. That should be more than enough um, for any lines that we, we have um, in this particular file. Um, we also have a character pointer, which points to the very first, the address of the very first character in that file. Uh, this will become apparent in a bit as to why we do that. We have the line length, the line number, uh, the number of glyphs read, the number of pages read, the number of kernings read. And then we have a while true loop here that we use to actually um, uh, loop through the individual lines of the file. So um, with that, uh, we go ahead and increment line number. So we increment line number right away since most text editors, uh, the line display is one index, not zero index. So um, this will mean line one is actually line one. Um, so that we don't see line zero there. It just makes it a little bit user friendly. And then we're going to go ahead and do a file system read line. Um, and we are gonna have a max length of 511 so that we have enough space for a null terminator at the 512 character. Um, so we're gonna read from the font file. Um, we are gonna read into this array, right? So we just need um, uh, a pointer, right? To, to basically read into. 
uh, as this requires a double pointer. And then uh, we also have the line length, which gets set every time we read a line. So if for some reason um, we return false for any reason, like we failed to read the file or anything, um, then we go ahead and break. Next, um, we're going to go ahead and skip blank lines. So any lines that have a length of less than one, we're just going to continue the loop. And then um, we're going to go ahead and analyze the very first character of that line by just taking line buffer, getting the first character, right? And then we're going to switch on that first character. And uh, we're basically going to process each character's uh, type. So if the first character is I, which is going to be our info here, so if the first character is I, we're on an info line. There's no other um, line type that starts with I, so we can just make that assumption. And then this is where we're going to use scanf, right? So we're going to say uh, scanf, uh, s scanf, returns the number of elements read, right? It's not the number of bytes, it's the number of elements read. So uh, for each one of uh, these things right here, uh, that is considered an element. So we basically have two here. Now, there is some serious binary going on here. Um, with what we're actually reading in um, in face. And this is a regular expression. I am not going to go into regular expressions right now. But basically what this is saying is read everything between the opening and closing uh, quotes, right? So it's basically going to say, okay, we're going to come up to face equals and then an open quote. And I want to keep reading into this value until we hit another quote. So it's basically going to read that, Okay. And so that's uh, the info face equals. It's going to read up to that, read up that first quote. And then uh, everything in here is going to be up until that closing quote. It's going to read into um, the first parameter that we pass in, which is outdata.face. Okay. And then we're going to read the size into uh, outdata size. And we're passing the address of that because it's just a number, not a string array or a character array. Then we're going to verify the line. It's an info line, line number. We're expecting two elements and the number of elements read, we're gonna pass that through, okay? And this same pattern is more or less gonna be used for all of the rest of them. It's just we're gonna process the data slightly different for each one. So uh, the next one is we are going to have the case of C. And C can actually be several things. So we need to actually break this out a little bit more. It can be the common care or cares line. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to handle the common line first, right? So if line buffer second character is O, then we definitely know um, that we're on the common line. And so what we're gonna do is if we have the common line, we're basically going to parse all of that data um, into, uh, whoops, there we go. Uh, we're going to parse all that data into several different fields. So if we take a look at the common line, uh, this is the one that has line height, base, scale W, scale H, and pages. And then uh, basically from packed to the end, we're just going to ignore. So uh, here we say elements red equals S scanf, line buffer, and here's the format of that string. So it's basically saying, okay, well, we have this common line height equals, and then we have an integer here and a space, and then... Uh, you know, so I should say some white space. It doesn't necessarily have to just be a space. It could be a white space. Um, and then base, um, and then a unsigned integer, and then scale W, and then an integer, and then scale H equals integer, pages equals integer, right? And then we just ignore everything else after that by not passing anything. And so we read that into line height, baseline, atlas sec size X, atlas size Y, and page count respectively. So since we have five fields here, we're expecting five elements to be read. This also allows us, since we have the page count, to allocate the pages array. So uh, if the page count is greater than zero um, and the pages array does not already exist, then we go ahead and set it. Now, we should probably also um, k warn here. Uh, actually, let's k error because without uh, pages, uh, we're not really going to be able to do anything. So um, pages is zero, which should not be possible. Font file reading aborted. 
Okay. Uh, and we're actually going to return false. All right. So uh, that's going to be considered uh, basically an error at this point that we can't proceed. Okay. So that's common. Um, and then uh, otherwise, we're going to have to uh, check for the next character being H. And of course, that won't suffice by itself because it could either be care or cares. So we need to actually look at the uh, index four or the fifth character to say if it's S, then it's a cares line. Um, otherwise, it is just a care line. So um, all we're going to do here is cares line is actually very simple. We're going to be using our S scanf again. Um, cares count is all the, that we have to process. So we have one field we're processing from that, which is the glyph count. Um, this will allow us to allocate the glyphs array. Um, we should probably also do this same check here, which I'm actually just gonna, um, let's see, glyph count, and then else this, and then copy this as well. And we'll say glyph count is zero, which should not be possible, right? Uh, that should be dot data, right? Okay, so um, we parse the count from that. Uh, we want to check that to see if it's zero. Um, oops. This else should be. down here and this one shouldn't exist okay yeah that looks right okay so um if the glyph count is greater than zero then we go ahead and uh, check to make sure that the array doesn't exist and if it doesn't exist we go ahead and allocate it um otherwise we go ahead and say hey uh glyph count is zero what are you doing guy all right, um, so we have that. Um, and now uh, we need to have an else clause here uh, because if we're not on a character uh, or a cares line, then we need to assume it is a care line, uh, which is exactly what we're saying we're doing here. So um, basically we're going to obtain a pointer from the data glyphs array, uh, which we would have allocated here. This line always comes first, so we should always have that. And then we're going to use our scanf again, except we're going to read a crap ton of elements, nine elements this time. We're going to read the code point x, y, width, height, x and y offsets, x advance, and page ID. So that is basically all of this up to here, and then we're ignoring that. And verifying the line that we got nine fields extracted, and then we're going to increment the glyphs red counter. Okay. Um, otherwise, uh, if we, let's see, if we do at the end of this, right? So if we have um, basically anything else, um, that is the second character besides H uh, or O, we're just gonna ignore it. And I may actually put a warning in here, um, but I'm just putting that there just so it's abundantly clear as to what's happening. Uh, okay, and then we need to break. And we should be able to move on to our next case. So the next case is going to be, um, the first letter will be P, which there's only one case for that, that's the page line. So um, this goes ahead and gets a pointer to a page. Um, and then, uh, does our scanf as normal. Um, again, uh, we get an, a page ID. Um, and this, uh, basically this HHI here is basically saying a half of a half of an integer. So that's uh, basically a, a I8. And then uh, we have the file here, which again is just saying read between the open and closing quotes there to get the file name. Um, and so we read that into uh, the page ID and file respectively. Um, which I actually just realized that we also have P up here. That's a double definition. I should probably rename that. 
let's call this page and let's just fix that real quick because that's kind of confusing. All right, so that's P. Uh, and then uh, finally, the last case is going to be um, basically our K, which is going to be um, kernings or kerning. Uh, so I'm just gonna actually paste the whole thing in here because it's basically stuff we've already seen up to this point. Um, if it's seventh uh, character, or I guess that'd be the eighth character, index seven, um, if that is an S, then we know we have a kernings line. So basically we just read the elements out of both of those um, and apply the kernings uh, as necessary, right? We just read the kernings. Again, it's all stuff we've seen before. So nothing uh, particularly crazy there. All right, uh, the last thing that we need to handle is the case of any other type of line, which we're just basically gonna skip it for now. We're not gonna throw any errors. We're not gonna do anything fancy. We're just going to skip it. Um, and so this should be, uh, let's see. I feel like we might be missing a bracket somewhere. So that's the default. I feel like we should have another bracket in here for some reason. Yeah, I think we were missing one. We were, okay. All right, so um, now that we've done that, uh, basically all we need to do is we need to write out the KBF file. So for right now, uh, I'm just going to call that and we're gonna return the result of that operation as the um, result of the whole thing, right? Because we kind of, we need both parts to work, okay? So uh, we've written the binary, um, we will have written the binary file. If we wrote that successfully, that will return true, okay? All right, uh, the last thing that I'm gonna do for right now, at least, um, is we're going to stub out our functions for reading and writing the file, okay? And uh, basically, all these are gonna be is just a couple of functions to um, read and write to a binary file. Um, however, before I do that, I do want to go ahead and fill out the um, resource loader create for the bitmap font loader. So that's gonna create a resource loader um, of type bitmap font. Um, there is no custom type. The load is gonna be the load. Uh, the unload is gonna be the font loader unload. The type path is gonna be fonts, which is Mm, up here, all right? So it's gonna find this definition and then know the look for the textures in here. And uh, then it's gonna return the loader. So um, really all we need to do is just the, um, the binary read and write. And so uh, what I'm gonna do is because this part isn't particularly in interesting and we've actually done um, quite a bit of binary file work uh, in the past with some of our other stuff, I am actually just going to jam the entire thing in here and just kind of walk through it real quick. So uh, we're gonna do the write first and then we're gonna do the read second. And so you can see here that there's a lot of repeated code um, in here. It's just a lot of the same kind of stuff. Uh, we're just writing all the, the various fields and whatnot. I'll touch on the highlights here. So the first thing that we do is we make sure that we can open the file. If we can't, we bleat about it in return. We keep track of the bytes written and the, uh, the right size. Um, and then we go ahead and set up a resource header. So we uh, set up our magic number here, um, which is that cafe babe. And then uh, we have our uh, resource type. Uh, we have the version, which is just version one for now. Um, the reserved, we'll just zero that out and we'll set the right size to size of header. We'll call file system right. Uh, pass the file, the right size is going to be the data size. Then we pass the header uh, or the address of header as the data. 
And then um, the address of bytes written to return back how many bytes were written. We pass that whole thing, or at least the result of that, to close if failed. And then we pass also to that the address of file. So uh, that will go ahead and expand to um, uh, if the function returns false, it'll write out an error and then um, call file system close against the handle um, and then uh, return false. So uh, this same pattern is basically followed through the rest of this. So the first thing that we do is we, uh, we actually write the font face string uh, after we write that. So we get the length of the string. Um, the right size is basically just going to be the length of that string. So we write the length of the string first, um, and then we go ahead and write that out. And then we write the string itself. So we, uh, the right size of that is going to be uh, the size of a character times the uh, face length plus one for a null terminator. And then we go ahead and write that out. Um, we then do the font size, the line height, baseline, scale X, scale Y, page count. Then we loop through each individual page and we write the properties of that page. So the page ID, uh, then the file name length, then the file name string itself. Once we've done that, then we go ahead and we write out the glyph count and then we write the glyphs. So glyphs don't actually contain any strings. So we can actually write the struct as is. We can just blit basically the whole uh, the whole struct. We could just basically jam those those bytes straight into the file. So that's what we do. We write the entire array that way. Then we write the kerning count, and then um, we double check to make sure that uh, we actually have kernings. So uh, if this is zero, we're not actually going to have anything to write for the kernings block, right? So we need to say if we have a kerning count greater than zero. Uh, then we go ahead and um, we go ahead and uh, write that out, right? And again, we have no strings in the kerning, so we could basically just jam the entire array into the file. And then we're done. We close the file. We return true. We've written our binary file. Woohoo! Congrats! Golf clap! All that. So uh, that is the writing, and the reading is basically the opposite of that. So this is going to be another, basically, paste and go. So the reading zeroes out the memory, keeps track of the, bed, the bytes read and read size, has a resource header. This time, um, the read size is the size of a resource header, and we read directly into that header, right? Again, we have no strings, so it's not a big deal. Then we verify the header contents. So the uh, header dot magic number has to equal the resource magic. If it doesn't, it's saying it's invalid and it can't be read. Uh, the resource type also should be of resource type bitmap font. If it is not, then that means we are using the wrong loader to try and load that file. And that's foobar, bleat about it. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, I have a to-do here about reading in and processing the file version. Um, we haven't done anything with file versions yet. Uh, I probably won't actually version any of these files until we are like at a minimum in beta. Um, and so uh, we won't actually implement this logic for quite a while because basically all that's going to do is uh, change the way that different fields are read for different versions. But this is still very, in, very much in heavy development. So um, I don't see the need to implement this now. So um, when we actually have a version of the files, then we can go ahead and write this if we have like a second thing that we add um, that shouldn't be in version one. So we uh, get the we read in the length of the face string and then the face string itself, get the font size, line height, base line, scale X, scale Y, page count. Um, then we allocate an array to hold the pages based off the page count. And then we read each individual page um, on its own. Now, uh, we only have to do this because we actually have to read the uh, file name. So we read the page ID, the file name length, and then the string itself. Um, for the glyphs, again, since it doesn't contain any string data, we could just read that data as is. So we have the glyph count, uh, the, um, and then we allocate a glyphs array, and then we read uh, the glyphs directly into that array. Uh, the kerning count is the same deal. We read that. 
Um, it's possible that we have files without any kernings. So if and only if we have uh, the kerning count greater than zero, do we allocate an array? Um, and then uh, we go ahead and get the read size and we read directly into that kernings array. At this point, we are done. We can close the file and we return true. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the entire loader. So um, it does look like a lot, a lot of code. Um, it is a lot of code. Um, text parsing kind of sucks sometimes. Uh, these binary files are a lot easier to read <laughs> than having to try and parse text. Um, but that's just you know sort of the way it goes. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and build this just to make sure that everything builds successfully. Now, uh, this is where I'm gonna draw the line for this video. Uh, we can't actually load in or read any of these yet, and that's fine. Um, we will handle that in probably the next video um, where we actually put into place our font system. And that is what's going to allow us to um, load these files uh, as, as it stands. One more point that I wanted to sort of touch on is we've kind of brushed on this topic of uh, different font types before. So we have, uh, where was that? So we have our font type of bitmap, which we've just implemented. And we have this font type of system. So we know how bitmap fonts work, right? They, they require um, a, a, a definition file, a KBF file here, or I'm sorry, a KBF or an FNT. Um, and they require a texture, right? That looks like this, right? Something like that or um, simpler version like, like this, right? And so a system font works a little bit differently. A system, a system font will actually take a, in, in our case, a true type font file, uh, like one that you have installed in your computer. And we're going to read from that directly and extract the glyph informations and render in real time um, to an atlas, uh, the, the characters that we actually need at the given time. So um, it avoids this, having to have this huge uh, bitmap full of you know, glyphs that we're never gonna use. Um, it avoids you know, this, this massive waste of memory that essentially is gonna happen with handling things this way. And so um, system fonts uh, basically allow you to use in our case, are gonna allow you to use the uh, binary font files themselves. And we are gonna leverage some tools to help us do that because that is another super complicated process, but um, we are going to go ahead and get that implemented. Um, at some point, it may be the next video, it may be the video after that, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we may wanna just get bitmap fonts actually rendering first. So at a very minimum, we're gonna have our font system in the next video um, and then hopefully the ability to render that uh, so that we can actually get some text on the screen um, so that we can actually start using it for uh, some debugging purposes and things like that. So anyway, this is where I'm gonna draw the line for this video. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I hope you guys are learning from this series. Uh, I know this was kind of a long one, but um, I hope you, know, you guys are finding it useful. In any event, uh, if you guys haven't already, please subscribe. Um, toss me a thumbs up, uh, hit the little bell icon to get notifications as to when new videos in this or other series that I have drops. And I think that's about it. I'll see you guys later.